or with a an emphasis on um, the medical school curriculum in particular. And so this has been a multi-part, uh, multi-year effort, um, and we're still developing and evolving as we're as we even speak. And so there's um, a lot to potentially go over, but what I'm going to try to do just to summarize is one, start from a little bit at the beginning. And one, I came to the University of Nebraska Medical Center about five years ago, um, and I currently in the College of Public Health. I also now have expanded my role a little bit. And one of the things that has expanded in 2020, we started the Water Climate and Health Program. This was a unique investment within the University of Nebraska system. And so it runs across the University of Nebraska system uh, to try to understand environmental health threats and how that potentially impacts human health. But we're not doing this just around it. Um, we're not just doing this around um, research, even though we are an academic institution, obviously we have a number of different avenues that we wanna to try to, to pursue. And so with the Water Climate and Health Program, we're trying to do interdisciplinary research, education and collaborative solutions to public health challenges associated with water and climate in Nebraska and around the world. And that's where our three, our four pillars really kind of stand. Research is kind of the basis. We're an academic center, you know, started with the, the concept of trying to understand the issues associated with climate change and environmental change and how it impacts human health. But we also try to do engagement, policy development, and education. And that education piece is incredibly important to our foundation because we are an academic institution and because we have the opportunity to educate the next generation of public health and healthcare professionals, um, both here in Nebraska and across the world. And so just to kind of step back for a second, um, with that investment that occurred about two, three years ago, we've expanded quite, great, uh, quite a bit. Um, we're now up to over 15, 16 faculty, staff, uh, that are funded through the program in some capacity. Uh, and we've also been working with students, both PhD students, medical students, and masters of public health students. And that's mostly in the, the context of, of research. And I'll talk a little bit more about this Emmett medical student program in just a bit. And so we do water quality work, we do climate change and health work, we work on extreme heat events, flooding and drought and extreme weather and air quality. These are kind of our core pillars of things that we've been working on. I won't go into those into too much depth because what I'm gonna to try to focus in on the climate change and health piece of our conversation, especially around how we're trying to develop education here at the University of Nebraska. And like I said, these efforts are continually evolving. Uh, what this looks like now might not look, uh, it might look a little bit different in a year from now. And so one, uh, just to kind of start off, we have a climate and health class in the College of Public Health. Um, this is offered roughly about every two years. Uh, it's in-person and online uh, so that we can get a, water, a wider breadth of students um, within the College of Public Health, so MPH students, doctors, uh, and the doctoral programs that we have as well. We also have a student organization, and that's been key with a lot of the work that we've done. Um, students and their support has been um, uh, a key part of all of our work and, and making some of this stuff actually come to fruition, especially in the context of education. And I'll talk about that. And then we've done integration into the medical school curriculum, and I'll spend uh, probably most of my time talking about that, and then also our enhanced medical education track that we have here at the University of Nebraska Medical School. So to start off with, um, students have definitely been uh, an important part of all this, and for this to actually come to fruition. And so when I first got here in 2018, um, 
I asked around and asked at, if there were any student organizations that were interested in sustainability or climate change or anything like that, environmental issues. And pretty much everybody said the exact same thing. Um, no. And they said that medical students are uh, concentrated on medicine first. And so they're, they're not interested in a lot of external activities. That was some of the responses that I heard. Um, they also said MPH students are here for a very short period of time. And so they're, it's a kind of a quick hit for them. And I was like, okay, when I was like, well, at some point, maybe I'll, I'll look into this more, um, a little bit more closely. And then with, before the first year that I was here, I had three medical students reach out to me. They found me um, because they were interested in developing a student organization that was focused on sustainability and climate change. And the reason they found me is somehow they, or I guess we're doing searches of faculty and saw that I had been, or I was brought here at the, to the University of Nebraska Medical Center to focus on those particular issues. And so from that, uh, which was about 2019 when it really got started, kicked off, and then obviously 2020 happened, which caused some delays and, and, and confusion with how all of this stuff could potentially work. That student organization has grown quite a bit. Um, now there's a number of students across the, all the colleges that participate and engage uh, with this program. It's called the Healthy Earth Alliance, they named it, and otherwise known as HEAL. And they've worked with the campus um, on sustainability efforts. They do activities within the community, trash pickups, uh, community gardens, tree planting events, all sorts of things. But they've also done um, work looking at how to develop the curriculum here at the University of Nebraska, especially within the, the college of medicine. And so they were looking for opportunities to better integrate and work on a number of different issues. And this story about how we started working on medical school curriculum um, has multiple points. And so this is where I'm gonna kind of tell a little bit of the story behind all of this. So 2020, the uh, global pandemic occurred, COVID was taking place. Medical schools were trying to refigure on what they were going to do. Two things happened simultaneously. Um, one, the medical school here decided to take everything online and they had a specific course that was gonna be focused on infectious disease. Some of the medical students then reached out to the organizers of that class and said that climate change should be part of it. And that's when somebody reached out to me and we had an entire lecture that was associated with ID focused on uh, the impacts that climate change can have on infectious disease. At that exact same time, Emory University uh, with Dr. Rebecca Phillipsborn there was doing an online course that uh, around climate change for medical students and it kind of expanded. Uh, Dr. Phillips Warren asked me to be one of the speakers for that class. I shared it with a variety of different people. Um, one of them is a, a funder uh, uh, and a local philanthropic organization that um, has close ties to the University of Nebraska. She took the class and watch my lectures, but then other lectures, and talk to the administration and said, why, aren't, why isn't there more of this going on at the University of Nebraska, especially within the College of Medicine? At the exact same time, students, the medical students, were actually pushing for this effort as well, and were reaching out to uh, the administration within the College of Medicine about trying to integrate uh, climate change into the curriculum. And so both of these things happened kind of at a simultaneous point. Uh, the administration, luckily, was very favorable to this. 
And uh, because of my efforts and because of my work in this area for a number of years, they reached out to me and asked if I could help with leading this effort. One of the things that they did was provide funding um, for a student to help work on this project. And so that's where Connor O'Neill comes into all of this. And Connor is an MPH student that worked under me for a couple of years and trying to develop the medical school curriculum and try and understand what are some of the opportunities that we can take advantage of here at the University of Nebraska. Um, one of the first things I asked Connor to do, and he took it on with extreme vigor, was to figure out what other schools are doing. And so he reached out to a number of different programs across the United States. And uh, if you're on here, you might have actually met Connor at some point, because I swear he tried to hit every program in the country. Um, and he did a great job. He was uh, incredibly thorough and, and a really hard worker and, and had a, a real vigor for, for trying to interact and engage with people. And so one of the things that we realized was um, that this effort is going to be kind of complex and it's going to take multiple different forms. And and it needs the medical students to be a part of the process. And so that's where Chris Detlefs and uh, Taza, uh, Taza uh, Winemaster came in. Uh, they're both in the College of Medicine. And what we asked them to do is go through the first year, and this is similar to what uh, Dr. Phillipsborn and students at Emory University and other places have done as well, and basically figure out what lectures are taking place? Are there places where climate change and health can be integrated? And then what would this potentially look like? And, and so with the help of Connor and Chris and Taza, they were able to kind of come up with a, a general concept map on how this could be integrated. And I wish I could take credit for this. But honestly, this was the hard work of a lot of students. I was just more there as like moral support. They went through this, looked through all literature, identified where there were opportunities, reached out to faculty members, engaged with uh, individuals to find out if there's opportunities for, um, or and also find where there's also places where the, this was already integrated into the curriculum and seeing if there's opportunity for expansion. And so Chris and Teza were the ones that actually presented this to the curriculum committee at the University of Nebraska in the College of Medicine. I was there for more moral support and they did a fantastic job. Um, and the curriculum committee was very, they had a very positive reception to this. Like it was, they were very taken by what they said and the amount of effort that they put into this and then decided to move this forward. And so that kind of gets to the importance of, of leadership within the university system as a whole. One, we had a very uh, receptive administration that thought that this was an important topic, but we also had leadership within the faculty themselves that we're willing to, to push this forward as well. So it went passed, it went through the curriculum committee um, and integration uh, was accepted. And, and so at that point, Chris and Teza started reaching out to faculty members for uh, looking for opportunities for integration to the medical school curriculum, the current medical school curriculum. And, that's still taking place and expanding. Um, and honestly, there was a lot of very receptive faculty that were very interested in this and willing to uh, uh, integrate this into their current lectures. One of the things that I was most impressed with is when we were doing this, we wanted to make this burden as light as possible. And so the medical students were willing to create the slides for the faculty members, but many of the faculty members said, no, I can, I, I've got some ideas. I've looked into some of this stuff. I'm willing to do it myself. And so that was how we started. And, and I just kind of expected this to be little quick hits all the way across. Well, then 
um, the curriculum committee reached out to me and said, you know, we would actually be willing to dedicate an entire lecture on climate change. And uh, in the fundamentals block of the, for the first year medical students. And uh, with, especially if it had a focus within diversity, inclusion and equity, which that's not a problem. I mean, climate change, obviously like many other things impacts the um, certain populations at a higher rate than others. So, and so at this point we've had um, integration. This has all taken place over the last couple of years. Uh, we've had one uh, lecture to last year's uh, M1 students, and now um, this August we'll be having our second lecture as well. So there's been a lot of development through this entire process. And like I said, the students are the ones that really should be here talking about this, but um, they're busy. And so the second piece that I wanted to mention was uh, the Emmet. And so here, and this was brought up by our Dean um, in the College of Medicine, and he actually recommended, he was like, well, there's opportunities beyond um, just talking about integration into the curriculum. And one of the things that he recommended was this enhanced medical education track. And so we have these for our medical students. This is kind of like a minor for medical students. They have uh, an area that they can focus on and it's supposed to run over their entire four years of their medical school training. And the emphasis is really more of that in-depth study on a specific topic that's more of interdisciplinary, uh, an interdisciplinary part of medicine. And it starts within halfway through their M1 year and then continues until uh, you know their their final year of medical school. We've run this for two years so far. Um, we have four students that are a part of the program. We keep these numbers low. They have to compete for this um, each year. They write up uh, uh, an application that requires multiple um, uh, so multiple paragraph uh, application write up about why they're interested in this program and why they wanna be a part of it. And the real premise of this is one, for them to get a better in-depth understanding of climate change and how it impacts health and, and healthcare in particular, but also it's supposed to help them with um, doing research in this area. And so research is a big focal area. And what we do is for those first year, they get the background and kind of introduction around climate change and health through the first, part of, the, uh, of their M1. And as they're transitioning to their M2, they have a block that's open during the summer. And that's where they get a focus in on research. And so what I do is I partner uh, the medical students with some of our research faculty and staff here in, within the Water Climate and Health Program, because the medical students obviously don't have a lot of background with statistics and some of those other core areas. And partnering them with uh, some of our researchers that have a little bit stronger concept uh, in, the, in the methodology, that hopefully builds a better relationship between the two of them so that they can have research. And the whole goal of it is for them to publish uh, an article, hopefully as a first author, and present their work at a national or our multiple national meetings. And that's really, uh, I think of this in the context of career development, so that they have that ability to make that next step in their career. So closing thoughts, um, students have been key to all the work that we've been able to accomplish um, from the beginning to the end. Uh, they've been uh, very impressive throughout this process. Um, we've also had, very fortunately, a supportive administration, and that has helped us move a lot of this along. But honestly, I think one of the reasons that the administration has been so supportive is partially because of that student engagement. Um, and the students are very highly motivated, especially medical students. They're always, they're always trying to keep in front of them. Um, and with that, one of the things that we really, uh, that I struggle with is, is making sure to hold their expectations uh, down a little bit because it is, uh, it is daunting. And I tell them that any step throughout this process is incredibly important. And then at the end of the day, um, 
what I'm really trying to do is build opportunities for the students to help them meet their career goals through leadership, publications, and, and presentations. Because especially for the medical students, I want them to be competitive for when they go for residency programs. And I've had a number of the students that have built the foundation around this actually say that this has come up uh, repeatedly within some of their residency uh, interviews. And I hope it was in a positive way. And yeah, managing expectations just all around, um, but that's been and uh, easy to do. And then, and then don't take too much on by yourself. That's been one of the key factors as well, because uh, otherwise you can get be overburdened and overwhelmed with a lot of this work as, as an individual. So with that, I want to thank the Clarem Hubbard Foundation for their support. Uh, we're also a partner with the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska and also the College of Natural Resource, uh, Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources. And if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to address those. Um, feel free uh, to reach out to us or follow some of the work that we're doing at the Water Climate and Health Program, which has been a uh, central point for all of this work as we've been moving forward. And so with that, thank you very much and happy to pass it along to the next speakers. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Bell, for sharing your curriculum initiative. And it's really wonderful to hear that students at University of Nebraska are so engaged on this topic and also that your administration has been um, really receptive to their efforts. So yeah, thanks again for sharing. Um, and with that, I will pass the baton over to Tammy and Lou. Hello. Okay. All right. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Um, my name is Lou Hunter, and I'm Associate Professor and Program Director for the Undergraduate Health Sciences um, at Thomas Jefferson University. And I'm also the Director of our Global Strategic Initiatives for our College of Health Professions and then the College of Rehabilitation Sciences. And then um, the, my co-partner on this presentation is uh, Dr. Tammy Barra-Shalita. So I don't know, Tammy, if you want to introduce yourself, um, we're kind of going to go, I'm going to lead it and then Tammy and I are going to kind of go back and forth on the, on the presentations. So Tammy, if you wanted to Thank go Thank you. So I'm from Tel Aviv University, the head of the graduate program at the Occupational Therapy Department and the head of the International Initiatives Committee at the School of Health Professions. Thanks, Lou. You're welcome. So um, Tammy and I wanted to talk with you today about um, going to look at perspectives on establishing an international ex academic exchange. Um, the topic is climate change and climate related disasters. So this international exchange that we're going to talk about is kind of our um, our final, like our end point, you know, in terms of our how we've gotten to that point. So we're going to kick off an academic exchange, which will be in 2024. But this presentation is going to kind of go over like our timeline and some details about some key um, steps that we took to kind of get to that academic exchange point. So um, this just gives you a little bit of a, I'm just going to move my bar here. This just gives you a little bit of, an, of a timeline about how do we develop an international partnership. And in June of 2018, Thomas Jefferson University, um, they formally launched the Jefferson Israel Center. And so that is led by our Dr. Zvi Grunwald, who's our executive director of that center. And he was working with Sheba Medical Center um, in Israel. So um, at that point, what happened was Dr. Grunwald, I reached out to him and said, who are your contacts in the Jefferson Israel Center? And then he gave me the names of Dr. Akron and Dr. Kalron. And, um, it ended up being that Dr. Calron was in the Department of Physical Therapy at the Stanley Steyer School of Health Professions, which um, Tammy works and is part of. So um, I was supposed to go in October of 2019 to Israel to kind of do a little bit of like, you know, understanding about, you know, Shiva Medical Center, Tel Aviv University, what did they offer? Um, I wasn't able to go. And then, of course, in January of 2020, and then, you know, COVID began. Um, however, I was able to reconnect with my two contacts there, and then they put us in chart in um, contact with um, Tammy and her group. So um, 
we ended up from January 2020 to September of 2020, we had a virtual event where faculty from both the School of Health Professions at Tel Aviv University and our um, faculty from JCRS, the Rehabilitation Sciences, we got together to really kind of have an introductory, you know, what are our inter research interests, what are our current work that we're doing, and then we try to figure out what is some type of shared research collaboration that we could do or any type of collaboration. And so, so then um, in May of 2021, um, Tammy, who runs the international initiatives at the School of Health Professions, we started talking about, you know, let's have an initial meeting between ourselves, you know, and our group. So um, in terms of our first official meeting as a larger group, we had representation from PT, speech language pathology, nursing, um, and occupational therapy, of course, in the School of Health Professions. And then we also um, have similar programs in the College of Rehabilitation Sciences, but we also, um, our nursing program is actually in the College of Nursing that we have at Jefferson. So we really kind of outlined what our potential collaborations were. Um, one was an interprofessional bidirectional student exchange, um, faculty development opportunities, and then research opportunities. So then in 2021, we're still in the, in the COVID environment, of course, but we kind of pushed through and still had virtual meetings, which is really um, a strength to um, developing this international partnership. And um, we really kind of wanted to focus on natural disaster management from an interprofessional perspective. So, and we also um, developed that topic because it was very new for both of our institutions. It was something that we really found to be, um, we wanted to learn more as faculty. And then we also wanted to kind of help our students to learn more about these topics. So um, in that, at that moment, we also added in the College of Health Professions, um, at Jefferson, as well as the College of Population Health to join our group. And then all from October 2021 to May, we had regular meetings between our institutions. And, and so um, here's just a kind of a slide about all the different people that had to make this work. So we had our Tel Aviv University faculty, and then we had our Thomas Jefferson University faculty that's located in Philadelphia, um, Pennsylvania. So again, um, a lot of Tel Aviv's programs are in one school, and then a lot of our similar programs are kind of spread out in different colleges. But we all really wanted to learn a little bit more. And so we kind of figured out what was going to be our first step. So in terms of our first step, we all came together and planned this educational symposium on climate change 2020 that occurred in 2022 in May. Um, it really was an introduction for um, the symposium was really an introduction for us as faculty because we really needed to understand like what is climate change? What is the effect of climate change on people's health and communities and populations? And we really wanna do a kickoff event to show our collaboration was starting. Um, so we kind of really thought about, you know, what is the impact? What is the impact on vulnerable populations? Getting some background information for people that attended this symposium and then kind of looking at, you know, where do we go from there? Um, what you'll see here on this slide is just an agenda um, of the symposium that we started in 2022. We really had a couple of keynote speakers. Um, one of them in particular was um, Dr. Price from Tel Aviv University. Um, let's go back. Because um, Dr. Price did our keynote address on climate change impact on public health, really kind of start the conversation. And we really wanted to kind of support and understand who at our institutions was really doing this work. And Dr. Price was doing that work um, at Tel Aviv University. So again, um, part of this symposium that we had and the highlight of the circle part, we wanted to have a panel presentation from, again, interprofessional healthcare professionals from faculty from both institutions to kind of talk about, you know, what climate change, what does it mean for our professions? And on the right, you'll see that we, each profession was charged with, you know, identifying what is our statement from our professions about climate change and sustainability. We wanted to really kind of have each presentation um, from the faculty from both institutions talk about what are the practice standards and education standards um, and how do they relate to climate change and sustainability and disaster management? Um, is there any evidence that's inclusive of, cult of curriculum in our professions that we know of in the programs? And then kind of looking at how do we commit to this? Like, what are our next steps? Because we found when we were doing this presentation that a lot of our health professions don't have this in our practice acts. 
or a lot of curriculums don't include these topics. And so, but at least we were able to present that together interprofessionally to show that we were a unified group that really wanted to move forward. And Tammy, please stop me if I'm like, I'm trying to meet that 20 minutes. <laughs> But uh, let me know, Tammy, if you have any other comments as we go along. No, that's that's great. Okay. Um, then after the symposium, um, and during the symposium, we actually had Haley Campbell, our very own Haley Campbell. Um, she spoke at our symposium, and that's how we were connected to Dr. Cecilia Sorensen and Haley um, through that first step. And then another step that we took is that after the symposium was over, we wanted to start that academic exchange on this content. But again, COVID-19 travel restrictions, we couldn't think about doing that in-person academic exchange in 23. So we ended up pivoting and that's all about what the environment was at the time and it still is, is about pivoting. And so we reached out to Dr. Sorensen, Cecilia and Haley and said, could you consult with us on a um, on a course, on an international interprofessional course on climate change and climate related disasters. And they said yes, because that's their area and their wheelhouse and their expertise. And that's what they do by helping other academic institutions like ours. And so um, we ran a course um, because our institutions are different, we're international, but also um, we had one school at Tel Aviv and multiple colleges at Jefferson. Um, Tel Aviv University ran the course for credit and then we ran the course as a non-credit elective um, just to do to our institutional variances. So the course was really our second major um, activity, if you will, between our collaborations with our institutions and our colleges and schools. And so the course ran on Mondays from 1130 to one, and that's Eastern time. Um, and then it was 630 to eight o'clock um, in Israel. So we kind of needed to make sure we accounted for that in the planning. There was 10 synchronous um, sessions, and the last two sessions were surrounded, were focused on group presentations. And then there's also three additional synchronous sessions that the students kind of met up with for their group work. And then also um, those three additional asynchronous sessions were dedicated to independent study. Um, each synchronous session, we as a group, you know, both our institutions and the faculty felt that we wanted to split that hour and a half. So we did 45 minutes of lecture on a given topic. And that way we had 45 minutes of active learning with small group discussion. And then um, again, this was all via Zoom. So we did breakout rooms for the um, active learning piece. And then um, we made sure that we had a faculty member from uh, Tel Aviv University and a faculty member from Thomas Jefferson University um, be present at each of those synchronous sessions um, just to make sure that they could help facilitate the active learning component, as well as get the acquire the knowledge from the speaker for that week. Um, we had eight Jefferson students and then 12 Tel Aviv University, all graduate students um, across OT, PT, nursing, public health, and biotechnology. Um, we did invite um, medicine as well as um, our design, like our architecture, our interior design students, um, especially from a sustainability perspective, um, but they weren't able to attend um, due to their schedules. So just to give an idea about the synchronous sessions, we um, ran them again, the first eight sessions, um, looking at climate change for the healthcare professional, kind of give us an overview about what does that mean? What do we need to be concerned about for climate change as it relates to our professions? Um, then we went into extreme weather, climate change, especially in terms of health equity, um, especially for vulnerable populations, which we touched upon during our symposium. We also did um, food security, um, degraded air quality, temperature related illness and mortality. Um, temperature related more illness and mortality is especially critical for our vulnerable populations um, that both our institutions and our professions have identified. So that was really something that we have to think about someone with a chronic disease or illness may be more susceptible to um, temperature related um, occurrences that are happening in the, in the world. And then climate and health communication, um, as well as health sector mitigation. From a course planning group, it was a very similar group as to who has been working together, um, but we did add in, um, Haley Campbell was our project director, um, who did an enormous amount of work to put everything together and to help us um, framework things for the course. Um, and then we also added Gail Jacoby, who is a PhD student in the OT department at Tel Aviv, um, who was very helpful, especially from managing the student perspective as they were going through this course. So we were really thankful for Gal. 
And then um, the course description itself, this just kind of gives you an idea about, you know, what we were covering. But again, thinking about the effects of climate change on health, on healthcare delivery was a key focus. Also kind of thinking about um, what is out there in terms of our countries. Our countries are affected by climate differently and also in similar, and there are similarities to it as well. So we wanted to kind of think about embedding that into the um, course content as well from a, you know, a country perspective and our countries handle climate changes differently. Um, and we wanted to learn from each other about that, um, especially as we were going through COVID at the same time that we were trying to plan this course. So again, um, this is kind of the course description um, and the topics that were covered. From a um, student learning outcome perspectives, these were our outcomes for our students. Um, Tammy and I wanted to highlight for you um, numbers one, five, and nine. Um, were we able to capture all these student learning outcomes in this one course for such an introductory topic to us? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, we did do a survey, um, which we're gonna look at the data on, but we really wanted students and faculty that were going through this to identify like the health impacts of climate change and the effective responses. You know, what do we do about it and what is offered? Um, especially also explain the role of local, regional and national and global policy frameworks. How does our, how do our governments, how do our um, communities, how do they deal with responses to climate change and natural human disasters was something we really wanted to start scratching the surface of with this course. And then in number nine, we really wanted to understand like the roles and responsibilities of different health professions and how do we prepare and respond to climate change. And so that's something that we really wanted to think about these three key ones in addition to the other learning outcomes. In terms of the required course materials, um, we had a couple articles that we thought were important and that the consortium helped us pick out. And then we also, the consortium, um, Haley and, and Dr. Sorensen and Cecilia, really kind of the global climate change and human health from science to practice, that was really something that we utilized as well um, from a week by week standpoint in terms of readings. Um, when we got together as a group and with the consortium, we really thought about what our assignments would be. So we thought that weekly quizzes would be important to have. Um, there was a final exam. Um, and then we had some reflection papers that were guided and, and then the um, PowerPoint case study. In terms of the weighting, the quizzes were optional because T Thomas Jefferson ran it as a elective. Um, and then the final exam was optional for TJU students. But um, we all students and participated in the um, reflection papers. Um, and then we also, they all participated in the PowerPoint case study. So while Tel Aviv University students received it for credit, um, we were able to provide a certificate um, and hopefully that might change in the future, but we just had too many colleges with too many curriculum committees to try to get through in a short amount of time. And then um, some of the challenges that we had, um, we were establishing um, regular synchronous sessions. So we were on different time zones. Um, but Tammy and I, we, we, and our group, we figured it out. Um, so we had our regular sessions where we were like New York, Philadelphia, and then Tel Aviv. Um, and se uh, Israel is seven hours ahead of us. So we had to make sure we accounted for that when we were structuring the uh, virtual elective or the virtual course. Um, probably I'm demonstrating this right now with this talk is, but um, in terms of English, and we had to remind our instructors on a weekly basis that, um, it's important to understand that you definitely have two countries um, that are on every single week for the synchronous sessions. So kind of monitoring your speed, monitoring your enunciation, um, repeating as needed for clarity, especially questions from the group um, to the audience were really even more critical um, as we were working together between our countries. And then um, synchronous sessions, they needed more of a balance. So while we wanted that introductory material on climate change and we received great material, some preliminary feedback we got was that it, we didn't allow enough time, I think, to talk about really what is the role of our healthcare professions as they relate to these synchronous topics. So that was something that we would strive for moving forward is having more of a balance between the didactic and the active learning piece. Um, and then course delivery and approval, we talked a little bit about that, you know, and then um, we did receive in terms of funding, we received um, funding from our, um, like, from Thomas Jefferson University, we received funding from our Office of Global Affairs and Dr. Derman, who was our Associate Provost um, for Global Affairs. And then Tammy received funding from her institution um, as well. 
um, with their international um, office. So that was really helpful, but we're trying to figure out what do we do in the future in terms of external grant funding for um, our academic exchange. And then just some next steps. Um, we hope to take this content, we're gonna review the course survey of how it went, and we're gonna try to take this content because we couldn't do it as an in-person exchange, we're gonna do that um, hopefully in 2024 in Tel Aviv and kick that off in Tel Aviv, um, Israel. Um, we're trying to determine what the best week is given spring breaks and all those types of um, things that we need to consider. Um, we're looking at pre-departure requirements, especially looking at independent and group preparation before they even go. Um, really kind of listening to all the pre-recorded lectures that were given during the during the course this semester. Um, we have those recorded, and so we're going to think about how do we balance that more with the pre-recording, and then how do we add more of that active learning that focuses more on uni professional as well as interprofessional amongst our participants for next spring. Um, in addition to doing that, that week-long um, exchange, we're going to look at observing in healthcare settings and understanding more domestic healthcare delivery challenges between um, Israel and the United States. Um, and those are kind of like our next steps. Um, we did use, um, one thing I didn't mention is we did use Canvas for Thomas Jefferson University to deliver the course content. And Tammy, what was your um, delivery Moodle. Of the learning system? Moodle. It was the Moodle. Moodle, yeah. Yeah. So um, those are basically like our next steps. So um, I think, Tammy, what else do we wanted to cover that I might not have covered in? I think you covered everything. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so we really are really excited about this collaboration. We really feel that it's one of its kind in the sense that it's interprofessional. It's working between two academic institutions, you know, from two different countries. Um, we're hoping to partner with other countries and other academic institutions as we kind of get our footing more when we kick off the academic exchange relative to this content um, next spring. So. I'll stop there. I could show you Canvas and all that, but and the prompts we use for the reflection papers and the group presentation rubrics and all that. Um, but I'll end there. So maybe for another time. Excellent. Thank questions. you so much to the both of you. Um, I'm really curious just to see the results of the survey and how this like initiative continues to improve and develop. Um, and it's been a pleasure to be a part of it as well. Um, but I think we can move on to some questions. Um, where we have one question in the chat, and I think this is probably more for Dr. Bell, but Tammy and Luke, please feel free to chime in. Um, Max Flynn from University of Wisconsin says, thanks for sharing great programs. Love to hear examples of how slash where climate change topics are integrated in your curriculum, whether it's large lectures, small group activities, basic science, public health, clinical rotations. Um, interested to know. Maybe Dr. Bell, if you wanna go first. Sure, <laughs> I'll give it a, a, a first hit. Um, so within integration, um, one, you know, the, within the public health, within the College of Public Health, we have an entire course that's just dedicated to climate change and human health. Um, and that kind of runs through it very similar and in kind of a somewhat similar fashion to the one that um, was just presented previously with Lewis, uh, Lewis's example. And then with the medical students, um, you know, we, we do have that one fully integrated course around climate change and medicine um, that kind of is a, a very broad hit. And the whole premise there is to really just kind of give the foundations of what is climate change? How does it impact human health? How does that potentially impact healthcare? And really that broad overview. And that hopefully sets it up for when the students are going through the other courses uh, are, are hearing that from the other lecturers as the semester goes along. And that was kind of the, the thought process as well, is that, you know, obviously they can't, you know, for example, uh, I think psych, respiratory, um, renal, um, maybe cardiovascular have all integrated, and I'm forgetting one in there as well. 
But those are some of the blocks that have, have already agreed to integrate climate change into, into the curriculum. And one of the thought processes there was if the students didn't have a, a good foundational background on climate change and health, um, they probably wouldn't get a lot out of some of those lectures. Although I would say most students are pretty well versed in climate change just in general uh, compared to like the, the average audience. So that's in a broad, a broad nutshell <laughs> kind of a thing um, to, to try to summarize a little bit of some of the work that we've, we've done. And then what are the actual integration? Um, I need to follow up to actually see what, what's been going on within some of those classes as well. Great, thanks, Tammy. And Lou, did you have anything to add to this? I think just um, in the terms of like integration into curriculum, I think one thing that we had to think about was what our institutions do. And a lot of times speaking to us from Thomas Jefferson University, we need to um, gauge interest before we kind of integrate it. And, you know, I'm from a physical therapist by background. And then, you know, between our different programs, we kind of start with um, when we're doing interprofessional work um, electives. And we try to go from that standpoint first, just to kind of see what um, interest we can engage and get from students and then even from faculty. And that way it kind of helps us as we're kind of moving forward maybe to the next step about how do we really integrate this in the different departments and programs. We kind of usually start out with an elective um, that's kind of, you know, sometimes we do it for non-credit, sometimes we do like a one credit elective, you know, um, with a few assessments built in just to kind of um, start out, you know, a newer topic, um, especially as we're trying to make it um, general enough um, and inclusive enough for all the different departments. So that's kind of where, our, where we go from that direction. So just to add to that, um, I think also what helped to integrate it, at our end, it was also elective for the graduate program. So I think what helped uh, the committee uh, understand the importance of that uh, topic is that actually, all um, health providers, nurses, PTs, OTs, and um, communication disorders, they're going to, to meet these people affected by climate change. So, and, and until now, I'm not sure how well we prepare them. So I think this was a very um, strong reasoning um, to help um, actually approve that. So we did manage to get uh, the course approved and the students to get credits for. Yeah. Great, thanks so much. And um, to, Ma to Max and anyone else on the call, I dropped a, uh, a resource in the chat, it's called Climate Resources for Health Education. I really encourage anyone to check it out. Um, it's an expert reviewed repository of learning objective slides and case studies specifically for climate change and human health curricula. Um, it's more geared towards the medical students, honestly, and it's by uh, organ systems and specialties. And I think it's just a really, a really great resource for integration at like any sort of um, like curriculum level or like sensitization of a particular institution. So I just really yeah, encourage you to go look at that. <laughs> Um, well, we have a question uh, from Diana Alcantara. I think this is more towards the Jefferson and Tel Aviv group. Um, maybe if you could talk a little bit more of how your collaboration started and how it was possible with two or more institutions. Lou, I'll start. <laughs> um, so collaboration is first of all about reaching out. And I think it's important to notice that uh, the collaboration was to begin with interdisciplinary. So it's not only between, it's not in only international, but first of all, it's interdisciplinary within each and within each country. Um, but I think what um, Lou actually quite elaborated and um, gave a very uh, deep background, I think what helped uh, the collaboration actually, I would say, succeed. Um, but we 
it shows, it took us a while, a while, like Lou described before, to get to a topic that we're both ends are interested in, to really um, find a topic which we all feel that it's a valued one. And so once we got to that, and so A, valued, um, and B, we were all at the same level. In this case, most of us did, really didn't have any knowledge, of course, not research, but even more than that, like basic knowledge uh, on, on that topic, like climate change and the health professions. And all of us, so this is a the same level, and all of us really were very strong about that it is an important uh, topic to occupy. And I think those pillars maybe were, were the ones that um, promote a successful collaborate, collaboration. Lou, do you, do you have anything to add? I think, no, I think everything you said was was on point and, and totally accurate. And I think one thing that also helped us too was um, the COVID environment in the sense of um, that we were able to communicate more than I think pre-COVID. Like it was one of those things where, you know, to jump on a Zoom call, and to have regular consistent meetings was actually like um, easier knowing how to do that because of this environment that we find ourselves and have found ourselves in. So I think it became just kind of routine to be able to meet regularly and consistently and um, really just kind of keep tab tabs on each other and kind of figure out where are we at with these um, initiatives you wanted to do. So, and we try to keep it, um, you know, building blocks to get to the academic exchange. So, you know, getting that collaboration together and identifying what that valued and meaningful one would be, and then doing the symposium and then going from the symposium and adding that next step um, to the course and to get some content. I think the small steps, you know, when you look back on them, those are the most important things, like clear small steps and not to try to do everything, but what is your collaboration gonna look like? Is it, you know, a faculty development opportunity? Is it a research study that you want to do? Or is it, you know, an academic exchange? Or can you tie them together? Um, and that was really kind of thinking simple and and meaningful and then going from there. And then what are your yeah. incremental steps going to be? Yeah. 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 Thanks, Tammy and Lou. I think Do Dr. Bell also kind of pointed towards that, not to try and do everything all at once like the the small steps are like often like the biggest when you look back on it um i have some questions actually for dr bell out of just like personal curiosity um what was sort of the uh reaction of the 2022 pilot curriculum that you had mentioned was like the final product of all of that effort and student engagement what was the reaction within the in in which capacity sorry like i guess i guess from i know you said you had a positive response from the administration but in terms of like actually like integrating the curriculum like how did the students respond oh yeah the well from two different perspectives like one um i'll kind of step back and 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 it was it was interesting. Uh, so one with the students with the engagement of the curriculum committee, we had a very receptive curriculum committee. I wasn't exactly sure where it was going to potentially fall. I, I heard conversations around the country, especially with some of the interviews that Connor did um, about all the reasons that other schools had a problem with getting integration and and getting re a receptive audience. And I heard a little bit of that stuff, but honestly, we had a pretty favorable group on the curriculum committee that saw this as being an important topic to move forward on. Um, and originally, there was the the discussion about having an an individual lecture, and and originally it was kind of thought, eh, this this probably too much time, uh, which was very similar to what others had said in other programs. That that's a lot of time for medical students because they already have a very packed curriculum to try to add any additional information into it. Um, but obviously that changed at some point 
in during these discussions where they realized it was possible to to have an, an entire dedicated lecture on this topic which is great and then as far as um you know the the students one the the students themselves that reached out to the faculty members you know chris and Teza, were amazing they did all the heavy lifting like it was just a, it was impressive to watch them and just try to keep up with them because chris was especially he was pinging every faculty member that he thought was of potential interest and before we even did that one of the things that we did and i forgot to mention this was a survey of the faculty members beforehand to see potential receptiveness around this issue just in general and there was a high level of of or the high percentage of faculty that were very receptive to climate change and try to understand its impacts on human health. But it, there was obviously a, a limitation on, on understanding. And that was one of the things that we were able to identify of that survey as well. Um, and then the students themselves, one of the things I would love to do is a survey of the students to see how they've actually liked hearing and seeing about some of the, this material within their, within their lectures. We haven't done that yet. I can say anecdotally, uh, I had a number of students come up to me afterwards and uh, ask me additional questions about the lecture. And that's actually how we got one of our Emmett students, um, uh, the Enhanced Medical Education Track students, because she listened to the lecture and I made a pitch about the Emmett and then her uh, and another one applied for the, the program. And so it was, it was a, um, and so I think it's been favorable. I think it's been good. It's it's kind of, but it's still, it's a growing process. And I'm hoping, you know, next year, the first year was when I gave my lecture, it was much more of a broad um, brush kind of uh, looking at some of these potential health impacts. This next time that I do the lecture, I want to be a little bit more focused on the, the clinical impacts as well. So hopefully, as we keep uh, moving forward, that this will continue to get um, even more beneficial for the students as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think all of these initiatives are sort of just like evolving kind of beasts a little bit, but um, it's really interesting to hear that you did a faculty sort of like receptivity survey. I think that would be really valuable at a lot of other institutions as well, just to see um, where everyone's at, but uh, we're we're near the hour, so I guess maybe one final question for you all, if maybe just like thirty second kind of blurb on what sort of advice that you would give to any students or faculty that are either like embarking on you know the process of climate and health integration. Um, yeah, would be great. Maybe start with Tammy and Lou. I think one thing that Tammy brought up that's really important is reaching out, you know, and think about what is the academic institution or what is the, you know, health facility and, and reach out and try to make a connection. And to think that if you have an interest or if a group of faculty or students have an interest or staff, whoever it is, that even though from our perspective, if you're in one country and someone's in another country, they might be thinking the same thing. So even though we're like far apart, like Tammy and I, like in our different countries, there's a lot of things that develop through this partnership that we had a lot of similarities about. So I think don't be afraid to like reach out because it's definitely to be able to find some commonality is much easier than you think it may be. You know, depending on, you know, wherever you live, wherever your background is, whatever, like, I think that was one of the most important things that we're seven hours apart, but in different parts of the world, but like, we're able to be productive and have these meaningful, um, you know, connections, you know, and how to and have these outcomes. So I think it's in, important to know that, you know. So I'll say, I, I think that when something is very important, you just don't give up and it works. <laughs> I like that. I like both of what you said. And, and for me, I, I think and I, I've said this already once before, but the students have been key um, because I, I know that I would not have been. This was something that I was thinking five to 10 years down the road, maybe I'll try to tackle. But it was the students that came forward and really pushed for this to happen. And if it wasn't for them, this would not have occurred as quickly as it as it did. Uh, and I've heard 
uh, other places struggle um, based off the fact that students weren't as engaged or involved. So I think students have been key for me. But I'm also jealous of the, the collaboration that you have uh, because I think uh, just having it multi-institutional is a real benefit. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's a definite level of jealousy there. Amazing. Well, thank you to all of you for sharing. Oh, sorry, Lou. Go go ahead. <laughs> well, I just was I just was saying real quick quickly with the students. Like it's you know I agree with you know Jesse about the students and how important it is. And they for Tom Jefferson University, like their students, they did it as an elective without credit. And so like they did it based on like we have this idea for this course. We think this topic's interesting, and we've gotten feedback from students and faculty, and they were all in. And they did a group presentation where they had to do slides and talk and and all that into an international audience. And so, um, yeah, so I think that student energy is um, very captivating when you're working with these different um, initiatives. Absolutely. Well, just, <laughs> just in the interest of time, thank you to all of you for sharing your incredible initiatives and you know curriculum, um, but really do reach out. Um, the consortium exists to make this process of integration easier um and i will be posting this recording online um and i encourage you all to visit our website for any resources and thank you again to all our presenters and we'll be in touch and i hope you all have a great rest of your day and with thank that you. will end end today thank all you right. take care take care everyone right. thank you